Well, hello everyone and welcome again to Plain Nest Universal Conversation with myself, Anne Walsh. Today we'll be having an honest conversation about living with breast cancer. Many people who get breast cancer always tend to have it at an older age. My guest today discovered that she had breast cancer at the tender age of 28. This conversation will be real honest and transparent about the reason why it is really important that one gets checked. One does all the necessary things that it doesn't matter when you get when you get that intuition, when you get that feeling that you go out there and do the necessary step to protect yourself. My amazing guest is Brooklyn Corbett. She will be telling us her own journey and how she overcome the challenges of living with breast cancer pain at a tender age of 28. But before we get started, let me tell you a little bit about Brooklyn. Brooklyn is a pharmacist and a Menemian breast cancer survivor. Diagnosed at the tender age of 28 years old in 2020. Following her diagnosis, she underwent active treatment over the course of eight months, which included two surgeries, chemotherapy, radiation, and hormone therapy. Though some would let a diagnosis like this bring them down, she insists on using her story to advocate publicly through social media channel and inspire others that they can be joy found after cancer. Her philosophy takes on life is that cancer is only a chapter in your life and not your whole story. She shares relatable raw content on her Instagram page, Brooklyn underscore style, surrounding her diagnosis and her life post-cancer. She's an open book for all and continues to advocate for the disease today. I can't wait for you to all meet her and enjoy this conversation. And hopefully you can learn one or two things about anyone who you might know that might be having concerns, difficulties to kind of advise them that they might actually go out and seek help. Meet my amazing guest, Brooklyn Corbin, as we share her story and understand how to live with cancer or find out that you've been diagnosed with it and still find your joy. Meet Brooklyn. Well, hello everyone and welcome again to Painless Universal, conversation with myself and Welsh. As I said in my introduction, today's conversation is one I truly love. I love when people are so honest and open about their condition, whatever they're going through, their journey and sharing their honest insights. We're talking breast cancer pain. How do you deal with it? How do you overcome that challenges and how you find your joy? Brooke Lynn here will be telling us about her own journey and how she's found her joy. How are you today, Brooklyn? Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. I am super excited as well because not just do you talk about this journey, you're a pharmacist. And so as a pharmacist, you know more than, you know, you know about the drugs you take, you know about the you know, side effects of the drugs you take as well. You know about all the challenges that comes with what you've, you know, what you've experienced you've been through. But before we get started, Brooklyn, who are you? Well, I am a lot of things. So I um, grew up in, a, in the States, in America, and I, um, you know, everything was normal. I was just a regular girl, what, spe what seems like a couple of years ago, until everything kind of turned upside down with my cancer diagnosis. So I was diagnosed at 28, and that was just last year in 2020, March. It was the same month that the country set, shut down with COVID. And so the exact same weekend where we stopped allowing people into medical offices and buildings was the same week I was diagnosed. So I went to my very first appointment alone, um, which was pretty crazy because it was a lot to swallow at that time. Mm -hmm. um, but then I have completed active treatment and am currently on some medication now that I take every day to prevent my cancer from coming back. I've completely changed my social media platform into one where I am now a patient advocate. So a lot of the things I post now are advocating for the disease to try and help end it, and then also being a resource to other people who are going through something similar as, you know, that I did. So um, I'm excited to be here, and I'm a lot, I'm really excited to talk about my story. I, I am excited that you are here and we're having this conversation because 
what people don't realize, you were very young when you were diagnosed, 28, and that's not an age people typically think they could ever get cancer because it's such a young no. age. Um, can you remember your childhood before you even got diagnosed? What was your childhood memories like growing up? Always very positive. I had a big family. Um, there were four of us and I was the youngest with a twin sister. And so we grew up in a very small town, but um, on a farm, we did lots of farm work and we had animals and we just had a very close knit community. Everyone knew everyone. We were all very supportive of each other in the community. And so it was always a very happy childhood, I would say. Oh, wow. So tell me your journey. Let's do, because we're talking about having an honest conversation about breast cancer journey. And this is something that a lot of people don't know. If in your opinion, for so someone who is just being diagnosed with um, this whole journey, going through that um, pain, when did you realize what breast cancer was? Because we hear about it, there's all these charities out there doing lots of work, but you never really take those things seriously until, you, you know, until it really hits home. When did you really understand what breast cancer is? Right. So I think I had a slight advantage being a healthcare provider. So being a pharmacist, I was familiar with breast cancer, but, um, you know, it wasn't something that I dealt with on a daily basis in my clinic. So I didn't work with those medications often. I wasn't as in-depth in knowledge about breast cancer. I, I knew the general gist, but not that much. Um, and so when I was 25 years old, I found out that I had a gene that increased my risk for having breast cancer in my lifetime, upwards of 80%. And so the reason I found out that I had this gene was because my twin sister did genetic testing randomly, found out she had it. And so I was like, well, let me get tested. Found out I had it as well. Um, my doctor at the time recommended that I get what they call a prophylactic double mastectomy, which they remove all of the breast tissue and put implants in. But you're 25. I felt like I was invincible. I was like, I've got time. This is not going to happen to me. I'm so young, right? Which is what everyone said um, until it did happen. And so uh, once I was first uh, had my annual screening last year, they said, you know, there's some suspicious activity on the imaging you maybe don't need to biopsy it. It's probably just dense tissue. You're probably fine. You're so young. There's no other risk factors. And so I was like, no, if you see something suspicious, let's biopsy it. And that's when I went into overdrive. My mind immediately went to, it's probably breast cancer. And I did all of my research and I came in to my follow-up appointment with a great understanding of you know, what breast cancer is, what the treatment might look like. It was very overwhelming and you can get into some crazy Google searching in the middle of the night when you're afraid. But um, that's kind of when I did my first deep dive. And then once they said, you know, it's cancer, I was like, okay, so this is something we have to deal with. It's something that we're gonna have to go through, but you know, having the most knowledge about it and being aware and being able to advocate for myself is gonna be important to me. So going in with some knowledge was, was very helpful when i think breast cancer i always think it's something where you feel the you feel around the breast and look for lumps because that's what i've always thought breast cancer that's the only way i mm -hmm. see as being diagnosed with breast cancer and you're saying no actually you didn't find out this way the traditional way that we've all been taught that the way you found out was because you did some testing your, your, your twin sister did genetic testing and from the genetic testing she realized that she had the chance of doing this and you went on to do the biopsy i mean you did the um, test could you just really describe that process how did you really find out because everyone I'm sure that lots of people like myself think it's just the traditional method and they're young, they'll think, oh no, nothing of it. How did you really truly find out you had breast cancer? Yeah, and I love that you bring that up because a lot of people think that that is the only way to find breast cancer. You have this lump, you have this aha moment of, oh my gosh, what is this? But I never actually had that. And that's because it was caught early. So because I was doing annual screening every year, I would go in and get a breast MRI and they would look for anything that looked suspicious because I had the gene that increased my risk, the BRCA2 gene. And so every year I would just go in, I would get a breast MRI and I started at 25, like I was saying. And for the first two years, it was normal. They said, everything looks good. I went in on the third year at 28 and inside of the milk duct, um, so deep inside the breast tissue, they saw some activity 
Um, it was not a lump per se, but it was like some cells that looked a little bit unusual. And so that's like, maybe we could biopsy that because it doesn't look like the other breasts. Um, and so um, there was never actually a lump. It was the early stages of a lump when the cancer cells are starting to kind of look a little bit different and move towards making one. So I never felt anything. After they biopsied it, they were like, these are definitely cancer cells. And then when I had my surgery and they looked deep under a microscope after they looked at some of the tissue, not even caught on imaging, they found some other really, the, the largest tumor was like two millimeters, two or three millimeters. Mm -hmm. So small imaging didn't even pick it up. So because I went in early, I was diagnosed at a smaller stage than if I had waited until I was like 40, had my first mammogram, who knows, it could have been such a larger lump. Wow, that is such an honor that you did this because at least that saved your life. And I'm glad that you now advocated for other people to take on board this message that not because you're young means you could escape from things, just go test yourself and do to see and you know, see different methods that especially when it runs in the family. Can I ask, does cancer run in your family? What made your twin sister to think that she needed to do this genetic testing? So it's not very common in my family. I had one aunt that was diagnosed in her early 40s who had passed away a couple of years before she decided to do genetic testing. She had breast cancer, but unfortunately she, you know, she kept a lot of it to herself. We don't know a lot about the type of breast cancer she had or what she went through. She was very private in that regard. And so all we knew was that she was diagnosed and we found out actually later when it got to the point that it was terminal and it already spread. Mm -hmm. um, so after she was diagnosed, um, that was the only person in my family. And so my sister was like, huh, I want to know if I have any risk factors or genes that would make me more likely to have cancer. And then that's when she found out. And then I was like, oh my gosh, like, let me find out too. I say all the time, I think she's the one, she got testing because it, it saved my life. Like yeah, it's the only thing that saved my life. I truly believe that. As a young girl, when, you were, when the whole doctor came to the office and I know I know this happened during the pandemic time when things were very restrictive how did you make sense of what you were going through uh, when they first told me that it was cancer yeah well honestly I think I was in denial for that first day I remember I was at work when I got the follow-up call about the biopsy results and they were like you know good morning Ms. Cobb I regret to tell you and as soon as she said I regret I was like oh my gosh I think she's about to say I have cancer she was like you have cancer and I was like and then she said a whole bunch of stuff that I have no I, I like went blank at that moment I have no idea what she was saying but she was I'm pretty sure it was something about following up because everything starts moving really quickly once they hear cancer and I just remember like not even believing it. I went right back to work in my office. I treated my patients. I came home that day and I sat down and I was like, oh my gosh, I think, I think she said I have cancer. And so I called my mom and then, oh my gosh, the, honestly, I didn't cry for the first time about it until I heard all of my family cry. Calling my mom and telling her she just lost it on the phone. Calling my fiance, he lost it on the phone. Like, that the hardest part was telling others, honestly, more than it was accepting it for myself. So why did you decide to start that honest conversation about um, cancer, like being an advocate about it, about what breast cancer is truly about? So I remember when I was diagnosed, my uh, support team, once I started going into the office, they sent me all of these support, virtual support groups and everyone was older. You know, we did have that commonality that we were all diagnosed with cancer, but average age was like 50 and up. And so I was the youngest person and I felt so isolated, so alone on top of being in the pandemic where you can't really meet anyone and having a suppressed immune system because of the treatments, it was very isolating. And so I wanted to be a voice, especially to younger girls out there who are going through the same thing because it, it feels that way. You feel like you're an anomaly, like you're the only one. And then going through cancer treatment, all of the side effects of these medications as a young person, it's, I feel like it's even harder, right? Because Right now, um, the type of cancer that I have was feeding off my body's estrogen. So they put me on medication to suppress my body's ability to make estrogen. So I'm essentially in temporary menopause that's medication induced. 
And being a young person in menopause is just, it's its own battle in itself. So there's just so much that goes along with the disease. And I just wanted to be an advocate to share for others. I get messages every day, 30, 40 messages of people saying, oh my gosh, like that happened to me too. I, I Thank you for sharing this. I feel so less alone. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's what it's all about. And that's so important. I always say to people, there's nothing beats when people have that conversation, especially when people are, are, are going through similar things like yourself. And then you can share things and you understand if, you're, if your body's doing it rightly or if your body's doing it wrong, then there's something you need to correct. And just by talking to others, when you look back at your life, what was life before cancer like, um, before cancer happened? And now that you've, you've gone through this process, how do you compare both and what are you doing differently? It's so funny because sometimes I'll go back in my phone and look at photos of me before cancer. And it seems like I don't even recognize that woman. Like it seems like, right. I um, and that's just because I feel like my perspectives on a lot of things have changed since my diagnosis. Um, I value time and people a lot more. I try to be more present because, and my, my family hates when I talk like this, but it's the reality. Like you never know, the cancer could come back. Who knows what could happen? No one knows how much time anyone has here on this earth. But what we make use of that time is I think is so important. And so the things that are important to me now, advocacy, um, family, friendships, relationships, being present in the moment and not taking things for granted like time, I think those have really shifted for me. I don't think I lived in the moment as much before. And um, it was always like, oh yeah, I'll, I'll get back to that person or I'm gonna hold this grudge or I'm not gonna go after that one dream that I have because uh, I've got time. Now I think the things that I want, I go for in life. And I just have such a higher value on things that feel like they matter more. And so, you know, as, as in doing what you do now, how can we let more women who are going through, especially young women, because I, I know there's a lot of advocacy out there for helping not, um, women who are older going through this process, but young women, you just said um, the, you, you know, you get these menopause symptoms and most people were thinking, what, what about if I want to have kids and all this reality starts to kick in, you probably can't do this right now, you can't have kids or you probably didn't even plan to get your egg frozen and now you're like, what if I can't, what if I can't do this? What, how are you helping other young women who, to let them know they are truly not alone and these are the things that they can do? So a lot of it is just sharing resources and information. Some things I found out when I was diagnosed, some things I found out actually after the fact. So for example, when it comes to egg freezing, one of the reasons why I didn't do the egg freezing was the cost of it. I'm not sure how much it costs there, but here, no insurance in this country will cover it, even if you're a cancer survivor, which is crazy to me. And so to um, freeze just even a few embryos the cost is upwards of like 10 to 12,000 US dollars, um, which is even more in pounds. Cool. And so it does not cover it. And then that's the cost, that's just the cost to do the process. If the embryos don't take, you have to do that whole process again. You have to pay an annual storage fee. And so I was like, you know, a lot of people I know in the community have taken out large loans just to be able to afford this. And so um, I didn't do it, but later on, I found there are some resources that will cover the medications. There's some grants out there that will help people based off of your income. And so now I share those with my community and I'm very open and transparent. I'll say, I didn't do it for this reason, but here are some resources out there. If this is something that you're going through or considering, or you feel like it's not an option for you, here are some things that might you know, affect your decision. So I I like to share all of the knowledge that I had going in with things, um, especially related to medications. I'm very transparent about all of the side effects of medications. And I let people know as a pharmacist, like you've got options. So sometimes your doctors might try to steer you towards one medication. There's options out there. And if one medication isn't working for you or you don't, you know, the side effects are not tolerable, let's talk about it. Like talk to me because there's so many different things that you can do and ways that we can do these. Uh, you know, when you said, and I love when you said that about the lockdown effects, because 
that was when you actually had to go to hospital. How was that? How have, how have you been able to manage with the lockdown? Because most people, the problem with um, the pandemic is that a lot of effort of many medical staff are being focused on the pandemic because of the virus itself, not forgetting the other illnesses. So how have you managed to voice your opinion to make sure that you were prioritized and being looked after during this that difficult time? Yeah, so going in prepared, I go in, I had my notepad and I had my questions ready because <laughs> there's this thing, we call it chemo brain. After you receive chemotherapy, for some reason, like short-term memory just is not where it used to be during chemo and even after chemo. And so I went in every appointment prepared. I had my questions written down so that I would not forget. Um, there's so many different apps for those who are technologically savvy. There's this one app I use called Abridge. It's very helpful where you can record the conversations with your doctor's office. It transcribes it, saves it for you. So if you want to send it to someone else, revisit the information later, it defines terms, medical terms and medications for you. Mm -hmm. So I have so many different resources to best prepare me going in so that I can be the best advocate for myself. Because if you are uninformed or you don't have your questions in, it's very easy for a doctor to say, this is the plan, this is what we're doing. And then you just say, okay, because you're not prepared. You don't have the knowledge going in. So um, it's almost like studying for a test. The night before every appointment, I'm reviewing things. I'm going into the details. I'm looking at my old notes. And then I go in as best prepared I can so that I can advocate for myself. Well, Brooklyn, before I let you go, I have to ask you, what is the critical advice you give to other patients out there who have to tell their your, um, loved ones that they just received this terrible news? How do you think it's best to communicate to loved ones? Because you said it wasn't hard dealing with it, dealing with the news yourself. The, the hardest bit for you was communicating to your loved ones, telling them that this is the news you've just received. What advice would you give to someone who has just heard this news and need to tell their loved ones, but not quite sure, or even their kids, I know you don't have children, but from your experience and, from, and also telling your employees as well, what advice would you give to others out there? So the biggest advice I could say is you have to accept it yourself first. Um, the last thing you wanna do is call someone hysterical about this and you know, you're not in the right space to share it. They're not in the right space to hear it. So um, you know, I really think kind of trying to accept it yourself, there's no right time to tell anyone. Like it's big news, it's gonna be devastating regardless. But I think um, you know, a lot of people feel the pressure, like I just found out the news today, I need to tell all the important people in my life. Take some time for yourself. It's okay if you need a couple of days to process because it's big news. Process it for yourself. Um, you know, find the best way that you want to tell who you want to tell. So you don't need to be public. I didn't go on social media and tell everyone. I told only the most important people in my circle, and I had a very intimate one-on-one -on -one conver conversation with each of them. Um, and so I think just giving yourself time. Um, and knowing that there's no time frame or limit on when you have to tell them. Um, I have had some people in this community who have told people after they <laughs> after they started chemo. So it, there's no right or wrong way to do it. Um, but I think in a good headspace, being already accepting of it yourself is a good place to start. Coworkers, I would say. Uh, I thankfully had really, really understanding coworkers. My boss felt like family to me and I had been there for like three years, but our, our coworker community was very, very close knit. And so um, we cried together and I told her, and I was a professor at that time. I was a pharmacist working at a pharmacy school and she was so understanding. It was uh, March when it happened. And so we were in the spring semester and she said, Brooklyn, I'm sure your students will understand. I will move all of your lectures to the days that are at the end of your chemo cycle where you feel your best. Um, and cause I wanted to work. I didn't want to be that person that just stopped working and just you know wallowed in my thoughts. So I was like, I want to keep working. We were virtual at that time. And so she moved all of my lectures to the end of every chemo cycle so that I had my, you know, all of my energy is, or as most energy that I could have to do it, which was very, very sweet. Well, Brooklyn, thank you so much. I really appreciate you 
being very out there, being honest about your experience, having an honest conversation with the world, not just yourself, but with the world. So anyone else who's going through this difficult challenge, you just kind of you know, understand that there is hope. There is there's hope. hope. Any final message before we uh, end our conversation today? Yes, I just want to say, and I tell this to everyone, breast cancer does not discriminate. It comes for the older, the younger, the black, the white. Everyone should be doing self-breast exams, checking their breasts at least once a month. If you have a strong family history, consider genetic testing because it could be the thing that is, you know, it's honestly, it's life or death. So finding out if you have any genes that predispose you to having an increased risk of a cancer um, can be very helpful because you can start imaging earlier. So. That's true. Well, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate this and I wish you all the best with everything. And I pray it doesn't come back again. And this is it. You're finally healed and you could get on with your life as you know best. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. You're most welcome. Thank you.